Okay, I, I think we could start now. So, um, welcome everybody to our uh, talk today. My name is Annette Tang. I'm the chair of the Silicon Valley chapter of IEEE EPS, Electronic Packaging Society. Um, our chapter has been serving the Silicon Valley for many, many years, and we organized interesting talks on electronic packaging for local engineers to allow them to network. We have quite a lineup of talks uh, this for the rest of the year, two talks every month. And we like to thank Lou, who is going to introduce the speaker today for lining up so many talks this year. It's such a banner year for our chapter. So uh, we have recordings of all our previous talks from earlier this year and last year and all previous years on our website, which is uh, uh, shown at the bottom of the page. And, okay, this is the volunteers who keep our chapter active and uh, knew all the talks. So we would like to show who they are and want to give them recognition, especially to Paul. We want to congratulate Paul Wesling for winning the presidential award from uh, Chris Bailey. And that's our website if you want to download previous talks and the talk today will be recorded and available at this website. And uh, finally, if you want to get involved with our chapter activities, uh, please contact myself or Asma. Thank you very much and I will uh, let Lou uh, take over. Hi everybody, uh, this is, uh, I'm Lou Nguyen here. I'm the director of the programs at uh, the chapter. And uh, as you can see from Annette and on the website, uh, we have uh, a list of talks scheduled throughout the year. And I just want to highlight that we have uh, the two talks coming up in June. If you are working in uh, 3D and uh, heterogeneous integration, uh, you might want to listen to uh, the talk. Uh, uh, the first one on modding technology for the next generation integration schemes. And that's from EVG, a supply of bonding equipment. Uh, and uh, note that the talk will be held at 8 a.m., right? And this is to accommodate the speaker from Austria. And uh, the second one is uh, on uh, photonics. Uh, you know, uh, this is an area where the U.S. is actually lagging. Uh, in the Europe, uh, they have uh, like multi-year, uh, multi-million euros uh, uh, projects uh, essentially in this area. And uh, so I was able to schedule a uh, fix. Uh, they are a subcontract uh, manufacturer uh, doing work on photonics, and uh, they will be talking about one of their EU projects uh, looking at scalable, highly integrated photonics packaging for the 5G world. And so that should be interesting also. And uh, again, this talk will be at 8 a.m. Uh, because the speakers uh, will be calling in from the Netherlands. Uh, so that should be exciting, right? Um, so referring to uh, the topic for today, uh, it will be on quantum computing. And uh, uh, if you're, uh, I guess if you log in last time, uh, Professor Hamilton from Auburn had talked about packaging interconnect for cryo and uh, his presentation and the recording are on the website. Uh, today you will hear from Rabindra from MIT Lincoln Lab talking about superconduct superconducting qubits. And uh, again, uh, there is a third one uh, coming up uh, in November uh, that will be on uh, uh, quantum fiber optic interconnect for quantum networks. And uh, the speaker uh, will be Bernard Lee from Senko. And uh, this particular talk will be at 5 p.m. Pacific. And uh, that's to accommodate the speaker who will be calling in from Malaysia. So uh, if you want to learn more on quantum computing, uh, it's uh, never too late, right? And so uh, this is something that uh, you will uh, always uh, go out about uh, looking in. And then uh, in order to make sure that you don't have any misconception about quantum computing, uh, I just want to highlight that uh, there are a lot of sources around on the website. I serve on the IEEE quantum 
uh, as on the steering committee. And so uh, you see that uh, uh, EPS is one of the uh, sponsoring uh, society. Uh, there is uh, a lot of information on IEEE Quantum. Uh, there is uh, stuff on workforce development, essentially a lot of courses uh, that are offered by quantum practitioners. Uh, there's also a series on quantum executive, uh, whereby essentially uh, CEOs and directors of, uh, uh, for instance, uh, big programs on quantum uh, interview, quantum podcasts also, and quantum talks. So uh, by all means, if you want to find out more about quantum computing and you know, go to this website, not all of the things are related to packaging, but uh, if you want to learn more on devices, architecture, software, things like that, uh, that uh, is uh, uh, the, uh, you know, where to go. And uh, I want to highlight that uh, uh, for quantum computing, uh, please, uh, you know, this is uh, the flagship uh, conference uh, for IEEE quantum. Uh, essentially, again, uh, this will be a virtual conference. Uh, there are still, you know, key deadlines. It's not too late to send in a paper, a poster, if uh, you're interested. And uh, just some statistics from last year. Uh, it was uh, virtual. Uh, they got about 850 attendees last year. You can see the breakdown here. 40% are IEEE members, 60% are non-members. And uh, you see the breakdown in industry, academia, and government. Uh, 225 companies have participated uh, last year from 45 uh, countries and uh, they had that uh, 26 exhibitors. And uh, uh, the trend is that you know, we are busy essentially organizing Quantum Week and you know, we can expect uh, you know, essentially a much higher number this year for this uh, conference. So uh, getting to today's talk, uh, you will be hearing from Rabindra on a 3D packaging for superconducting qubits. And uh, just a brief background here, he's uh, a member of the technical staff uh, of uh, the MIT Lincoln Lab, uh, the Lab on Quantum Information and Integrated Nanosystems Group. Uh, before then, he was a principal engineer at uh, EIT, uh, which uh, uh, was uh, the old IBM Endicott. Uh, he has lots of experience in microelectronic packaging for high performance computing, medical, quantum electronics, and has been very busy. And uh, just uh, one last thing, I just want to highlight that, uh, you know, this series also is uh, uh, sponsored uh, uh, by the uh, EPS uh, Technical Committee on Emerging Technologies. Okay. So, Arvinda, the floor yeah. is yours. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about 3D packaging for superconducting qubits. First, I would like to acknowledge our group. It's a pretty big group, about 95 members are actively working in this project, and we are hiring also. Um, before I talk about quantum computing, I just would uh, uh, like to say one thing, that uh, classical computer does amazing things. Today's Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, machine learning, you cannot even survive a day without classical computer. But there are some things classical computer cannot do. And one such example is optimization. Optimization is the best solution of a problem among many possible solutions. Now, let me give you one simple example. So here is our team. And I just wanna say that this is the leadership team. They are about 10 members. So if I ask you how many different way you can rearrange these 10 members, and the answer will be 10 factorial. Now 10 factorial seems very small number, but it is not. 10 factorial is 3.628 million. So 3.628 million different way you can rearrange this member list. If I add one more member to the list and ask you to do, uh, uh, how many different ways you can rearrange, and the number will increase to 40 million. So 40 million different ways you can rearrange this member list. Now, if I add three more members to this leadership team, then the total number of rearrangement, possible rearrangement will be over 6 billion. That means over 6 billion different ways you can rearrange this members list. So classical computer can solve a smaller version of this problem, but when the problem is big enough of interest, 
classical computer either ran out of computing horsepower or it might take much, much longer time. And most of the cases, it may not possible to solve the problem. So you need to think of an alternative and there comes quantum computing. So the first thought process about quantum computing came in 1981 by Richard Feynman. He proposed that it's possible to make very powerful computing machine by using quantum mechanics. But the real punch came by Peter Soar. He did two things. First, he developed source algorithm, which has a real application of code breaking. And he also allowed to do fault tolerant quantum computing. And thereafter, many theorems, many research came up from few qubit to few tens of qubit system developed. IBM Rigetti started using cloud quantum computing. Basically, you can do online quantum research with using IBM and Rigetti's cloud computing facility. So we can say quantum computing is transitioning from scientific curiosity to technical reality. Now, if I compare quantum computing development trend with classical computing development trend, starting from vacuum tube to today's GPU, or even Carabas with a scale chip. Like quantum computing, classical computing development trend was also very slow initially. Took about 90 years to make first commercially available Pentium with a decent computing applications. So quantum computing is important for national security. So US government stepped in, not only US government, several other governments stepped in. Big companies like IBM, Microsoft, Intel, Google, and Vault. There are many startup companies came up. And one of the major application of quantum computing is for information security, which is basically driving the worldwide investment. So my talk, here is outline of my talk. And today I will try to answer three important questions through my talk. What would be the interconnect scheme? Can superconducting qubits survive flip chip and 3D integration process? And what would be the best possible option for scalable qubit packaging? Now, why quantum computer potentially so powerful? Now, let me start with a classical computer. Classical computers are based on classical bits. It can be transistor, it can be zero or one, or can be a sequences of zero and one. It's a discrete and deterministic, meaning if you set it as zero, it will measure as zero. If you set it as one, it will measure as one. On the other hand, quantum computing is based on quantum states. It is the superposition of zero and one make quantum computing so powerful, but it's a probabilistic measurement. If you have an identical sets of measurements with 50-50 superposition of states, then half of the time you will measure as zero and half of the time you will measure as one. So quantum computer encode information in a fundamentally different way than classical computer. For example, if you have one compute, one qubit system, the total superposition of states will be two. If you have two qubit system, number of superposition of states will be four. If you have three qubit system, number of superposition of states will be eight. This superposition of states allow quantum parallelism, 
meaning you can do many calculations simultaneously. So by the time you will have 50 qubits, number of superposition of states will be two to the power 50, which is good enough for high performance computing. But these are perfect qubits. If you go to any technical talk or any press release, you will see there's a quantum space race going on. IBM is developing 50 qubit system. Intel, Google is also developing 50 s qubit system. Again, quantity is important. You need quantity. You need quantity to do the heavy lifting. You need quantity to do the computation. But the number one thing is not quantity. It's the quality of the qubit. Qubit quality will determine how many gate operations you can do within qubit lifetime. Qubit lifetime defined as coherence time, the time at which qubit is in quantum mechanical states. But unfortunately, due to environmental interactions, qubit started losing its quantum mechanical state. So the question is, how many gate operation you can do within qubit lifetime to do quantum error correction to sustain computation? And for most lenient code, you have to do at least 10 to the power three operations per qubit lifetime. Here you can see superconducting qubit coherence time and you see this for different superconducting qubits. And you can see these blue dots are basically superconducting qubit fabricated by Lincoln Lab. And from here, you can see that Lincoln Lab is fabricating very, very high quality superconducting qubits with coherence time ranging from 50 to, micro, 50 to 100 microseconds, which is well above than the lowest threshold for quantum error correction. So we are fabricating very high quality superconducting qubit. And our objective is to develop 3D integration process, which is compatible to qubit design and fabrication so that it can maintain qubit quality. Now 3D integration is important for scalability. Now, here is an example of a five qubit transmon. Okay, you can see the qubit loop over here. This is qubit loop is attached to the capacitor. These plus signs are capacitors. And these greens are basically readout resonator and rest is control electrons. So the question is, how can you increase number of qubits of a system? And the simple way is that you can increase the chip size. And as you know, for any fabrication technology, as you increase the chip size, the complexity associated with it and will decrease the fabrication error. For 3D integration, we can increase number of qubits within a given chip by removing this readout, by moving this readout and control electronics to the third dimension. So our approach is our approach. It's a very simple stack up. It's all silicon technology. So MCM, Interposer, Qubit, all are silicon based. And it's a very simple fabrication approach. So you fabricate individual Qubit, Interposer, and SMCM separately. So our approach can fabricate as well as optimize individual component, qubit interposer, MCM separately, and then join them sequentially to create the 3D architecture. Now, our approach is similar to 2.5D technology, but 
we are using all silicon technology. We are using two layer of micro bumps and we are using active interposer, which is basically differentiating our approach from 2.5D technology. Now you might have a question that, why can't we put everything in single multi-layer chip? Because it's all silicon technology. Or why do we need interposer? Why can we put Cuba chip directly to the MCM? And the answer to these questions, I have answer to this question in my next slide. So if you put everything in one single multi-layer chip, qubit loops, coupler loops, readout and control electronics, then this lossy dielectric of this multi-layer stack out is going to reduce the coherence time significantly and see less than 100 nanoseconds. Now, if you put a MCM, if you put qubit chip directly onto the MCM, again, this lossy dielectric will interfere qubit coherence time. So our approach is put interposer between qubit tier and MCM in such a way that that interposer not only isolate qubit tier from lossy MCM dielectric, but also interposer will maintain the wiring density as well as qubit performance. So the advantage of our process that we can fabricate and optimize individual component separately and independently by putting interposer between qubit and MCM, interposer isolate qubit chip from lossy MCM dielectric. The interposer with superconducting ESV interrupted resonator or superconducting TSV based lump element ring resonator will help to reduce its readout circuit area. And the, the last point, which is very, very important, because we are fabricating and optimizing individual components separately, so there is an opportunity to use best possible known good die to make 3D integrated superconducting qubits with maximum possible benefit. Or in other words, you can say it is possible to combine multiple technologies fabricated using different foundry process. So here is our integration scheme. And as you know, that we have to use qubit tier, this individual component tier, interposer tier, and MCM. We have to use all three together to do a three stack bonding over here. But before that, we need to establish split chip qubit, and we need to show that the qubit is not causing or not damaging due to split chip process. The second, we have to do a flip chip qubit with interposer with superconducting TSP to make sure that superconducting TSP interfere, uh, in, interface is not damaging or impacting qubit performance. And then at the end, we will do three tier stack. So, first is flip chip demonstration. So this is a very simple approach, like a traditional flip chip. This is the interposer with T without TSV, and this is the qubit chip. You do the flip chip integration, okay? So here is your flip chip qubit packaged, ready for cold testing. And with this process, we actually demonstrate four key building blocks for flip chip qubit. We characterize blocks proximal surface impact. We characterize electrical conduction between the chip and off-chip coupling, capacitive and inductive coupling. So with our process, we characterize the effect of proximity of silicon surface and how qubit performance changing with silicon surface. 
established a very, very low interconnect resistance between qubit chip to the interposer, and also demonstrated off-chip capacitive coupling as well as inductive coupling. So we also do many split chip characterization. Split chip characterization is very, very important for maintaining qubit performance. We use alignment, bonding, and parallelism study. We use confocal scan to do the coplanarity study. And most of the cases we found the coplanarity is within the TTV limit of the top chip, which is really, really good. We use X-ray deformation to make sure the bump is not deformed or even if it deforms, it not create any electrical source. So X-ray is very, very important to optimize the bonding process. And we use infrared image to check post-bond alignment tolerance. Post-bond alignment tolerance is very, very critical for maintaining design features in Z direction. So here is an example of off-chip coupling. So here, qubit loop is on the top chip and the bias loop is at the bottom chip. And the design offset is minus one micron and zero micron. And from the infrared image, you can clearly distinguish zero micron overlap as well as micro, minus one micron overlap. So you can say that we are maintaining such a tight tolerance in the Z direction, which is very, very important for maintaining qubit performance. So now let's show some electrical characterization. So here is a daisy chain. The main difference between flip chip daisy chain to a flip chip qubit daisy chain that we need very, very low resistance to no resistance interconnect during qubit operation. So here is a daisy chain consists of about 2,700 indium bumps in series connections. And then we measured the interconnect resistance, indium bump resistance, including under bump metal is about 240 nanoamp per bump at 10 millikelvin, which is consistent with the under bump metal resistance. So indium is superconducting, so only the resistance coming from the indium. And this kind of very, very low interconnect resistance is basically supporting the robustness of our process. So we basically demonstrated the electrical conduction between the chip. Next is off-chip coupling. So here is an apples to apples comparison. So here is a single chip flux qubit where readout resonators, qubit, and control electronics, bias lines, all are in the same chip. And here is a flip chip qubit where the qubit chip is flip chip bonded with interposer chip and interposer chip is basically have readout resonator and flux bias lines. And then we package both chip and measure the coherence time and we found out that flip chip qubit coherence times are comparable to the single chip qubit of same design. So this is another experiment we did to confirm that the flip chip qubit, we can do off chip coupling as well as flip chip qubit maintain qubit performance. So we demonstrate electrical conduction, we demonstrate off chip coupling now we have to demonstrate interposer with superconducting PSV. So the interposer fabrication process, we follow a traditional interposer fabrication process with a TSV first approach. So it's a traditional approach with TSV first approach. Only difference is that we are converting this regular TSV to a superconducting TSV by introducing appropriate superconducting material within the TSV. And here you can see the critical temperature of TSV 
these TSVs are superconducting with critical temperature a little above 3 degree Kelvin. And you can also see we are yielding very, very high quality TSV. We are yielding more than 20,000 channel links. And the critical current we measure is more than 10 milliamps, which is good enough for qubit operation. So we essentially demonstrate individual component necessary for 3D integration process. So the next step is to demonstrate 3D integration. But I just want to also uh, say one more thing about superconducting TSV. The superconducting TSV is not only uh, useful for routing, but it can be also a part of readout resonators. So here is a superconducting TSV. So here is a traditional transmod chip. And you can see the readout resonator's length is about 1.2 millimeter. So by using superconducting TSV, we can design and fabricate lump element ring resonator with the resonator dimension is in the range of 55 micron. So you can see there's a significant area reduction. There's a significant size reduction as you go, uh, go from regular quarter wave resonator to lump element ring resonator using superconducting TSV. There's another advantage of superconducting TSV that you can create superconducting TSV interrupted readout resonator. So you can see this readout resonators. Okay, so half of the or part of the resonator is on the top side of the interposer, and then it's in basically interconnect the rest of the inter, uh, readout resonator by using TSV. So it's this process by using readout resonator, using superconducting TSV, interrupted readout resonator, can actually open up a lot of interposer area underneath of the qubit so that you can add a lot more functionality to the chip. So as I have said, we have demonstrated all the key components for flip chip qubit and TSV interposer. Next is utilize those experience and do a 3D integrations. So here is a 3D integrated configuration. You have a qubit tier, you have interposer tier, and superconducting MCM. So the basic difference as you go from flip chip to a 3D integrated superconducting qubit, you are moving from a single bonding to double bump bonding, and also you're using two layer of indium bumps instead of one layer of indium bump. So to evaluate 3D or three tier qubit, you have to again do two things. We have to first check the DC connectivity to make sure that the electrical connection is good from qubit to interposer to MCM. And also you have to show that, that you are not degrading qubit performance. But in all of our three tier stack bonding, we try to use qubit last approach, meaning that qubit will be bonded at the end to minimize any kind of additional bonding effect to the qubit qubit performance. So the first step is to do the electrical characterization. We call this 3D daisy chain. So we have made 3D daisy chain, 3D daisy chain electrically connect qubit tier to interposer to MCM to complete the daisy chain link. And it has about 20 metal interposers. So each daisy chain link has about 20 metal interfaces. And here is the critical current plot for, these, uh, for different chain lengths. So these are the short chain, which has about 36 daisy chain links. 
And these are the long chain, which has more than 1500 daisy chain rings. And you can see critical current for short chain is about 20 milliamps or more. And for long chains is more than 10 milliamps, which is good enough for qubit operation. So we did establish a high critical current 3D daisy chain. Next step is to compare the qubit performance. Now, we demonstrated and delivered several three-tier stack qubit using qubit last approach. Here is an example where it's a 10 qubit system where half of the qubits are on the qubit tier and half of the qubits are on the interposer tier. And we use qubit last bonding approach to make three tier stack. And again, as expected, because it's a qubit last approach, qubit performance in three tier stack is comparable to a panel or single chip qubit of same design. So we demonstrate a three tier stack or three tier qubit with which maintain qubit performance. So the bonding and the assembly is working pretty well. So what's next? How can you take this 3D integrated superconducting qubit to the next level of packaging? So let me give you a, basically a kind of roadmap and compare it with super, uh, semiconductor packaging. So this is an example, basically, what I'm showing over here. We're trying to compare your semiconductor versus superconductor packaging. And as you know, semiconductor packaging is heavily invested field. Every year, there's a new type of package coming into the market. So it would be difficult to put all the packages in this comparison chart. But what I put is basically some important semiconductor packages. For example, system in a package, package interposer package, 2.5D technology, 3D technology, and HPM technology. Similarly, superconducting or superconductor packaging also developed quite a significant. You can see we developed 16 chip complex MCM. We demonstrated 3D integrated superconducting qubits. And from here, there are many, many possibilities. I'm just showing you here a few examples. The one next thing we could do from here is instead of double bump bonding, you can do triple bump bonding, meaning you can extend the number of stacks into the structure. Okay, so you, from double bump bond to triple bump bond, where you can increase the number of stacks. Another possibility is that you can use super 3D integrated superconducting qubit assembled to rigid flex. Now, if you see today's superconducting qubit packaging, we use rigid bolt, we use flex cable and connectors. So this is rigid flex is a kind of automatic choice from rigid board flex cable and connectors to use rigid flex basically not only to increase io density rigid flex will have at least 100x more io density than traditional flex cable and connectors and rigid board but also it eliminates the connectors which is basically will be helpful to reduce the thermal loading And also I mentioned that our approach is very close to 2.5D technology. Now, I just want to give you a little bit comparison. It is not an apples to apples comparison. And as you know that 2.5D technology again is a heavily invested field. There's a lot of work going on in this direction. So we cannot really do apples to apples comparison. But what we are trying to show over here 
that our technology is comparable to 2.5. So we can compare that 2.5 D technology used micro bump. Their micro bump materials are mostly copper based with solder teeth. Our is India because it's suitable for low temperature application. Micro bump pitch, most of the cases is 45 micron. We are also delivering MCM with 35 micron pitch. Number of micro bump assembly, one layer used by 2.5D, but they do use C4 and BGA connections. We are using two layer of micro bumps. Maximum chips five, this is all data. Today, probably they're using more than that. We also have demonstrated four 20 by 20 chip integration as well as 16 five by five chip integration. Size of interposer is 750 millimeter square. Again, this can change for today's technology. We have also demonstrated up to 9,200 millimeters, millimeters square. Feature size 0.4 micron because they use 65 technology, 65 nanometer technology. We use high line, little, but if we use EX4 DPV, we can go down to 0.35 micron. So again, we are not comparing our technology to semiconductor 2.5D technology. But what we are trying to say that our technology is comparable to what today the semiconductor packaging is using. So which will be useful for future if we want to go for a hybrid architecture where semiconductor and superconductor can stay next to each other or can stay in the same platform. So our technology is ready to do this kind of integration. So now let me give you the future direction. So here is take a look into the future. We are developing 16 chip complex MCM. We demonstrated 3D integrated superconducting qubits. We demonstrated high quality qubit. We did demonstrate off chip coupling, superconducting TSV, high quality traveling wave parametric amplifier, and superconducting indium bars. Next is to combine them together to create 3D architecture. And then at some point, you take this 3D architecture and assemble to Rigiflex to create next generation quantum computing hardware. Again, this is one possibility, Rigiflex. There are many other possibilities from here we are thinking right now. So with this, I would like to summarize my talk. Now, if you remember, I was asking three questions in the beginning. What would be the interconnect scheme? And I showed there are two level of indium micro bomb with critical current more than 10 milliamps, which is good enough for qubit operation. My second question was, can superconducting qubit survive flip chip and 3D integration process? And the answer is yes. Flip chip survive, established very, very low resistant interconnect, also demonstrated off chip coupling. And my last question was, what would be the best possible option for scalable qubit packaging? Again, it's 3D integration with interposer in the middle will be the best option because interposer not only isolate qubit chip from lossy MCM dielectric, but also it maintains the wearing density as well as qubit performance. Thank you for your attention. Okay, Michael, you had a question. Why don't you go ahead and ask your question? Thank you very much for the presentation. It's very helpful. Uh, my question is uh, regarding slide number 14. Not sure if you want to jump, uh, jump right to uh, slide number 14. Uh, my question concerns the ESD uh, consideration for, yeah. Uh, so, okay, so we have a, this one you're talking about, right? So we have a standard protocol. 
right. for EST. We definitely do follow because uh, our lab is a cryogenic lab where we do use a cryo CMOS, even single transistor level. So uh, we do have uh, all the precautions and we include the design consideration if necessary for EST consideration. So we have a protocol for packaging this uh, uh, tiny chips and uh, even we have a standard protocol for all the EST sensitive devices in, including cryo CMOS because cryo CMOS are basically most sensitive chips for EST than qubit. So uh, qubit chips are EST sensitive and whatever the protocol we are using is good enough for protecting them from uh, dicing to bonding to packaging. Okay, so that part we have a standard EST protocol and it all survives. So you don't have to basically what I mean to say that you don't need any additional precaution for EST protection. If you have a standard packaging lab where you can package your CMOS devices, that could be good enough for Qubit also. Is that answering your question? Yes, thank you. Paul Kim had uh, two questions, one on the aspect ratio and another on the materials and the temperature. Paul, go ahead. Uh, I have two questions. First one is that the TSV, uh, from your picture, it looks like the depths would be around 200 micrometer. Is it right? And what is yes, the yes. You know, openings? What is the aspect ratio? So, what? So the, the TSVs are about 10 micron. 200 is the thickness. Uh, 200 is the thickness. Okay, 10 by 10, 10 by 20 for openings. Okay, I see. Yeah, it's the openings. Yes, yes. Okay. And the, the second question is that, uh, you know, your structures, 3D structure is touching the qubit. Uh, in which element should be, you know, low temperature tolerant? For example, is this an uh, interposer or below layer or bump, indium bump, are those all low temperature superconducting material? Yeah, indium bump is superconducting. Okay. And uh, the qubit used aluminum, it's also superconducting. Oh, qubit used aluminum. MCM, MCM used uh, use niobium is also superconducting. I see, everything is superconducting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you need any kind of a uh, dielectric from the DuPont, such as Captain, or do you need any request for special features, such as low CT or high frequency performance, or something like that? Yes, yes, that would be for the packaging portion. So, okay. So, what we are trying to do the this 3D integrated qubit, we would like to isolate all the lossy material, and then that once you finish the 3D integrated qubits, that needs to go to into package. And there you can do all sort, sort of different fancy things that you can use a, a low loss capton or polymer type material for rigid flex or even flex cables. Okay, Rick Marshall, you had a question. Please go ahead. Thank you. Fascinating presentation, Dr. Das. Uh, the question may have already been answered. It, it sounds like the MCM needs to be uh, superconducting, so it needs to be in a cryogenic environment. Um, uh, yes, my company yes, yes, provides yes. temporary interfaces for testing, and we've talked to a few uh, quantum compute companies. Do you need a, a, an apparatus inside the cryo chamber to be able to test these electrically once they're completed? Yeah, we, we are probably talking to many people, and 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 if you have interest again you can send me email me i can i can direct you to the right, proper appropriate person okay john Lasseter. john you had an interesting question please go ahead Hi, dr Dawson. uh the question i have is uh have you thought about utilizing uh glass interposer for uh better isolation yeah could glass you... uh, could be uh, could be an option definitely right now you know quantum is um, is uh, in a, like a, in a, not in a matured format, but class would be a, definitely an alternative low cost option. 
but right now most of the cases because we are not too much worried for the cost at this point the primary goal is to make sure that uh, the keyword performance survived and use best uh, the, the use the silicon device because it's a, it's a well known fabrication process and glasses yeah it's i know corning and several other area glasses also coming up it's a low cost version like, and, and definitely could be useful for qubit also it, it's not we haven't used because uh, again you need to develop a new process because we have a foundry it's easy for us to develop a silicon based interposer but glass interposer definitely uh, could be used and i think it's, it's in future probably it's going to be a lower cost option you tell you said you had a question please go ahead yeah uh can you hear me yes we yeah can. i can hear you yes yeah. uh, hi uh Rabbi. Uh, this is Yutao, and uh, good to meet you. Oh, how are you, Yuta? Yeah, great. It's a uh, long time not uh, talking to you. So uh, it is a fantastic talk. That I, ha I have one question for the uh, interposer. So yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, you mentioned uh, you the reason you use interposer is to avoid the lossy dielectric if we are applying uh, flip-trip bonding, right? So uh, I'm thinking, so if on um, your uh, S superconducting MCN uh, silicon substrate, uh, can you create a, a keep out area under flip trip area without any uh, circuits? And we can, in this way, we can avoid uh, those dielectric, right? So the, the, the main reason to use interposer is to avoid the low C dielectric, right? On the S yeah, yeah. The, what what so, we do? The, the interposer has also it's active interposer, so it has it has a it has some qubit loops, okay, for coupling applications, and that that also helps not only just isolation but also it has a coupler loops, which is uh, help to do. Uh, so we can basically remove some of the circuitry from top shift to the bottom for coupling applications. So, and, uh -huh. so, so uh, my, my question is that, uh, can you, can we keep the, the, this active coupling circuit, this, this few layers of, of uh, circuit on the SM, S, SMC and directly without this uh, multi-layer as you show in the that figure yeah under. so what what we do that if you don't do multi-layer then it's basically interposer without without tsv if you use mcm without multi-layers if you don't want any oxide then yeah basically what what we demonstrated flip chip qubit which is interposer without tsv because there is not oxide layer is not there so the mcm we use because if you want to do routing and control electronics amplifying. That part MCM could be a good option because there you have multi-layer stack. So uh, can we put? Can we design this uh, control electronics uh, away from yeah, the? Yeah, that's area that's what that's what a lot of people are doing. Oh, so it's another probability. It's, okay, I see. Yeah, yeah, you are. The MCM is adding a lot more functionality. Okay, I see. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much. It's a good presentation. Uh, Flavio, you had a question. Please go ahead. Um, a question is, I, I unfortunately was able to join just for the second half of the talk, but I, I was interested if you have any data on the S parameter plots for the resonators. You showed some um, coil structures for the readout, and I was just yeah, yeah. interested. So the, the, paper, the, you can, the, the data is available in the published article. Is it, I think it's published. So there is a there is a paper reference you can see you see there is a paper there is a paper coming up soon and there is a paper already published I triply micro it. Thank you. I looked at so this, this, this 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 work is actually published in this paper. Very good. I don't see any other questions. Uh, Lou, do you have any follow up or did I miss something? Um, I have a question for Rabindra. Uh, I mean, I, I've seen papers uh, uh, that people report uh, uh, using indium as an interconnect for cryo. And uh, so my question is, uh, you know, do you have any long-term reliability data for time cycling of these things? 
Yeah, so uh, we did uh, not for this program, but we did, uh, it's called a cycling test, like a room temperature to uh, the low temperature. Basically, the CTE mismatch, everything happened up to uh, probably liquid nitrogen. And thereafter, the CT mismatch was very, very slow impact. So we did thermal cycling within the environment. And we didn't see a, a basically any degradation. Uh, uh, the advantage of indium bump over here is it will give you a little bit of reworkability, but uh, also I have done reliability with indium bumps, and uh, it's it's basically it shows um, um, no impact interconnect well, price. So it it depends at what interconnect size you are using. But right now, indium is the, the best solution. It survives the cold cycle testing, I call it. It's not like uh, like your ATC, the thermal cycle was between room temperature to cold. And we have a cryocooler to do the testing, and we tested up to like somewhere about 700 cycles. And we didn't see interconnect as a major failure mode. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, Nathan, you had a question. Please go ahead. Um, I have two questions. One is, uh, what is the overall size of your dies within the range of the ball bonds? So the die size, we are using uh, most of the cases. I mean, the smallest is four by four, and the largest we have done uh, maybe ten by ten. But overall, superconducting chip die size is uh, up to twenty by twenty. This one will probably give you an idea. This is five by five. I've done up to 20 by 20. Okay, so, and, you, and you didn't see any issue with the size when we went up to 20 by 20? This is a full radical, so it's it's definitely the yield and other things is going to be impacting. What I'm showing this is that we have a bonding capability which you can handle different size die. And again, Thanks. it's, it's yeah, we can bond Definitely with indium, this variety of size. Okay, thank you. And uh, what do you think of Ion Q's claim that they can achieve uh, error corrected fault tolerance with only uh, 13 qubit redundancy? Yeah, Ion Q is also it's coming up pretty promising. The Ion Trap best is not superconducting qubit. That uh, both fields are progressing pretty well. Yeah, there are a lot of, uh, you can see press release going on about IMQ. Somebody is buying or investor or investing a lot of money. But both are very, very promising, of course. We are doing both of them. Yeah, they, they, they claim they only need 13 qubits for fault tolerance. Yeah, it's, it's you know, it's yeah, as I said, like, uh, if you see the semiconductor or classical computing development trend, once you start making a computing machine, then then you will see the progress on the cost and also uh, the scalability. So maybe right, right yeah, now we're talking about 13, but the moment you will start making, you will see the progress of making more and more computers. Right, I agree. Thank you. Okay. Um, Lou? Thank you very much, Rabinda.